I'm Courtney Barnes, Head of Marketing at Symphony of Sykes Company. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by my colleague, James Johnson, Client Director at Symphony, and Andy Firth, Director of IT Applications at First Group. Today, we'll be sharing best practices on delivering sustained value through intelligent automation. But before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit of background about both of our organizations. Symphony is a long-term Blue Prism partner with gold level certification in delivery and capability. We're a global consulting, implementation, and managed services firm that specializes in designing and deploying intelligent automation solutions that help our clients rapidly realize the full potential of digitized operations. First Group is the leading transport provider in UK and North America with over 100,000 employees every day working hard to deliver vitally important services for their passengers. Last year, over 2 billion people relied on First Group to bring them to work, to school, and to visit friends and family. So without further ado, let's get started. So I think I'd like to start out, first of all, by congratulating you, Andy, on being shortlisted for the Blue Prism RPA Newcomer of the Year Award. It's a tremendous honor and particularly impressive because you were nominated in both EMEA and global categories. Clearly, you've made a lot of progress this past year and achieved quite a bit of success. So I'm really hoping that you'll share some insights on how you and your team got started on your automation journey. Um, thanks, yeah, we, we started our journey um, probably a year and a half ago now, um, with a review of some of our processes, more the sort, of the, the sort of divested processes that we have around the business, especially in our bus business, where we had some repeated um, processes um, on, a, on a start form, which were, um, took a lot of people uh, some time every day, every week to create, and Symphony guys came and sort of helped us to identify the possible solutions um, on getting that automated. Um, the business has approximately 20 to 50 people starting um, a week in the bus uh, division. Um, not so much now uh, at the moment, but um, and that was seen as a, a quite a time consuming operation for the individuals in the 80 depots that we, we operate in the UK. James, do you think that maybe you could share a little bit from your perspective on what it takes to really build a successful program from the start? Yeah, absolutely. So working with First Group was uh, exciting uh, in that uh, First Group have you know, done an awful lot of work in other digital areas, but we're very open to working with Symphony and following methodology you know, and best practice, really an open, an open book to kind of tell us what would, what would work. So we were able to show um, the organization we had the uh sponsorship that, that we needed and we we're able to show them our, our methodology and, and the hyperloop that we uh we actually shape it out to be and, and describe it as um so that that was excellent that we could show that to first group and say we believe that when people follow a methodology in a very strategic way they have a really significantly greater level of success by, by following that through and avoiding potential pitfalls and you know, random acts of automation. So we were, it was, it was great to, to, to be able to, to do that and make suggestions. So as I said already, kind of that stakeholder engagement, the senior sponsorship was very important so that we could actually, as Andy's mentioned, some of the processes that were looked at, that, um, that the actual purpose and aims of the, the, the project along with um, what, where we, what we really want to do and why we were doing it, it was pretty much outlined you know, from, from the get-go. So everybody knew what we were trying to achieve. So you know, from there, you, you start to move into opportunity assessments and looking to where the program's gonna work and, and how that's gonna uh, be set up, uh, how the program will be run, whether the, the, a lot of the work and the delivery will be done in-house or out of house, you know, all that kind of stuff, all these things that you really need to lay the ground rules, really know the why, the how, uh, and then when you're going to do it. So then, you know, we move into education about what what a good process looks like. You know, if you're going to be deploying and working and supporting that process and that program, you know, what, what, what you need to do. And then when you've done that and you get into looking at those individual cases, and you mentioned some of those um, DAS bus starter uh, ones, getting into a, a detailed review, everybody gets very excited about building automations and building robots, but actually there's a couple of stages across that. Uh, we, we believe in an, an agile delivery methodology, but there's quite a lot of solution design first, test that follows afterwards before you drop it into run and support. So that these processes are securely run, kept up to date, all the glitches are being covered and people are uh, looking at them constantly to keep them running. Once you've, you know, you've done that, um, you kind of look back and when they're up and running and you've got them going, 
you really look at them again to see what was the value. Uh, you look at your post-project appraisal and look at that. And that's when the hyperloop comes back around and becomes a continuous uh, loop whereby you start to look at uh, the next projects, next business areas, next programs, the next processes in that area um, that you want to look at next because the success of RPA is, is, is such that you do create a culture uh, of RPA and success. You'll get in the process area you first started, you'll get you know, a mirror image of another batch of, of processes coming through as well as other business users will want to share the success that they've seen uh, the early adopters have. Uh, and that's, that's really what we've done with First Group, take them around that, that loop several times going into, into lots of business areas now uh, globally. Yeah, I, I think from just carrying on from that, James, that we had our ideas and our thoughts of what would be a good process to be automated. And that certainly was with the starters. But I think after that, the interaction between your team uh, and our businesses was much more of a case of, right, we think we've got these 30 things we want to look at. What do you think? And using your expertise to come and say, okay, well, you know, what is that going to save in terms of time, process, control, accuracy, all those kind of um, headlines to say, right, well, we'll do these ones. And we focus then on, you know, the rollout then was to the divisions where the benefit would be the greatest, not just because it's RPA, we'll do it. Andy, I think the thing that's so unique and interesting uh, in the DAS process, as we've already said, was something that really captured business imagination. Is It's very unusual for an intelligent automation process in that this process was being conducted out in 70 different bus depots, which is very different to the normal contact center environment or back office or even front office uh, environment. 70 um, separate bus depots with different legacy and backgrounds, different types of processes, uh, sort of very uncontrolled or controllable in terms of being able to get around them all at the same time and have people you know, overseeing them. And the, the fact that you use this opportunity to harmonize process, bring it together and uh, give people the ability to follow the same streamlined, faster process uh, for the first time uh, ever. So I think it's quite unique uh, in that fact itself for an intelligent automation uh, deployment, which I think is worth, worth saying um, how ambitious and, and, and interesting a, uh, an area you went for to prove how this could be deployed uh, and have success across the whole of uh, business like yours that frankly um, happens in those kind of environments. So that's where you really want to test it. Yeah, I think the one example of that was, you know, we had this thought of doing our supplier uh, queries in a certain way. And then when uh, Jack and, and, and our team sat and looked at the, um, the opportunity there, we, we changed the whole process and changed our idea of how we were going to do things to be more proactive in a process rather than being reactive to saying this supplier hasn't been paid and he's phoning me up saying, where's my money? So I think from that point of view, I think that's exactly what we did. We, we kind of developed where we thought it was going to be a good idea and, and, you know, and there was a good idea and, and it was just tweaked to say, let's fit the role, change the process to make sure we're being the most efficient, even with an RPA process. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I think, you know, business casing everything before you do it, uh, to, that you know, it's going to, going to deliver is really, really important. But, you know, we do see people who the utilization uh, is, is poor because they haven't done everything to, um, harmonize, synchronize, um, standardize processes, uh, and, you know, really make the best of, uh, of what, what happens, you know, with those. And as you know, we built those processes and in that particular finance area, you'll get that utilization and they're more than paying for themselves and giving some flexibility. But when we apply that to some of the other uh, standalone finance areas that can start to use that, you know, you'll, you'll get better utilization, uh, in the future, you know, of those. And that's why those ones were chosen first. I think that's great. I think you guys, you've really hit on it quite a bit when we think about maintaining momentum, because unfortunately what we see with a lot of clients is that, you know, they're able to have some initial success, maybe some quick wins, but then they, they plateau in that way, right? And so then they struggle to progress it forward in order to achieve their enterprise value. Um, so you're well on your way. And I think, um, is, there, is there something, Andy, that you want to comment on a little bit about kind of what's next and how will you continue to build upon this momentum that you've, that you've established over the past year or so? I think that, that our issue right at the moment, like everybody else, you know, we, there's been a, a pause in business and there's been a refocus on things that are a bit more um, crucial to the business than, than automation and efficiency right at the moment. But that's not to say that we still have our pipeline list. Um, 
we have two or three areas that we've already identified that we would go and um, and actually look to to improve um, and we're also going to try and roll out the similar things that we're doing or have done with the finance team in, in Aberdeen to other areas of the business um, so where they do a similar role we'll tweak what we've got now to to you know make sure that it fits that business purpose but there's there's a, there's a I say once once we get back to um, a normal situation then we will pick this up and, and, and start again um, and, and continue on the journey. Yeah, it's, it's really important, isn't it, to establish some early success that people can see, start the discovery in other areas and almost waterfall as one is doing discovery and other is doing implementation. And then you do more discovery as, as the, the previous one, the discovery is doing implementation. So that, that, that kind of is, is pulling through and recovering success. But, you know, the environment that we find ourselves in quite at the moment is not what, what anybody really expected, is it? And in the transport sector, uh, you know, entirely. It's uh, it's an amazing, it's amazing things that you guys are having to achieve to kind of get everybody uh, back on track and back moving. No, I think I think that's one of the things that you know this this kind of process has helped with. When we've obviously made um, uh, all of our office-based staff in Aberdeen work from home, um, all of these kind of processes are now carrying on as they are, and it's all sort of digitised. Therefore, no need for people to you know, open post and see things coming in from suppliers and all that kind of thing. So from that point of view, it's, it's probably perfect timing for us to, to implement those, certainly the three main ones that we did up in, in Aberdeen um, that has helped us through this thing to make that actually working at home isn't a major problem for a lot of the team. Um, so yes, it's been uh, particularly successful, I suppose, with, um, with the current climate. So some amazing unforeseen advantages uh, at this time uh, towards cultural change that you know, when people pick up their laptops and, and take them home that the robot stays in the office and, and keeps the, uh, the transactions taking over and everybody's proved that what flexible working will work uh, things keep going because you did those automations and that that's that's great sort of foresight uh, to, to have done that that's really paid dividends it's, it's quite interesting actually at the moment to see four distinct stages that we think people are are going through uh through the covid stage i mean there, there was that react where you know you need to keep the lights on and really just people uh getting on with stuff and really trying to keep the business going but very quickly that went into um a, a response what we're calling a, a respond phase where i think people were uh, a little bit more rational you know in their decision making that, that, that they had to make so if, if people are working from home and particularly regulated businesses or you know, financial jobs, um, if they're customer facing particularly, uh, to keep people working from home, it has different business scenarios and different business risks. But people had the option to say, well, we're closed. Uh, and if you're a bank or an insurer or you, know, or you answering uh, client queries, you don't always have the option to do that. I did see some businesses who, unfortunately, because some of their offshore support, uh, they couldn't get those people working from home. You know, they were closed for, for a number of weeks. And I think uh, people have to make that's what we mean by the rational decisions is it going to be too much business risk to do that or is there just too much business risk to be closed and you have to kind of get on in um, some way or another so that's very interesting um, obviously people were really coping with keeping the operations going at, at that stage and there wasn't a lot of you know long-term strategic decision making but what we're seeing is uh, particularly around the automation that if, um, if some of your rules-based uh, work um, that that it was transactionally happening with your outsourcer, you know, offshore stopped. Um, people are now looking to automation and, uh, you know, what would have happened? Would we have been more, more resilient um, with that? So I think the, the, the reimagining stage is, is the next stage three of that. And people are making some really good uh, resolutions. And I know, you know, the first group and others are the same. It's like kind of, this is a, this is a great opportunity to really say, I haven't done some things yet, but this is, this is proved even more than a business case uh, would have done that this is the right uh, time to do it and think strategically uh, for the long term about what, what's going to happen. And I think the fourth stage, very few people are, are, are quite there, but elements of it are, are starting to happen and come through that the kind of re, reinvigorating of the business. And I think some of the people have had success and, you know, certainly your finance area that, that were able to say, you know, we did this, um, that energy does flow through. So, you know, what are you going to do with your structural changes? Um, you know, following, uh, consumer demand um, to really continue to work uh, agile you know there are things that you have achieved that won't put you off again I'm sure 
you know, in a, in a, in a digital ticketing kind of world that you've got train stations, bus stations, all going to look slightly differently. You're going to have to follow the customer demand to do things. And you've kind of got that, um, you know, re reinvigorated kind of approach to the successes that you've had, you know, not just on, you know, on the, on the RPA, but some of the, the reaction to, to COVID and getting your, um, operations running again so th those are the four th that we're seeing that we think will we'll follow through and i think that will take some businesses across the summer and some till the end of the year and into next year really yeah i think i think one of the things that we've been focusing on um, obviously at the moment people are advising not to travel on public transport so from a commercial point of view for a transport operator that's that's not good news but obviously we understand the you know the reasons why that's happening but in the new world how do we do it so one of the things that we've been doing on bus side in, in digitization is to let people know when buses are full now a bus is 80 seats um, at the moment at two meter distance that will take 26 people or around that sort of number of, of people on the bus so we haven't got four buses to run one behind each other so they can all sit in the same you know in the two meter distance so we've now got to tell people you can't get on this bus now that's all being done digitally through the ticket machine, through you know GPS and all that kind of stuff, so that you can see on an app that you stand at a bus stop, the next two buses are going to be full. I might as well walk or do something else. So you know all of that stuff has all come out of the reaction to to what's going on. Um, and I think what we will see from a from a let's call it a back office point of view, more pressure to get ourselves more efficient because we don't know what the you know we're going to return to. So you know there will be commercial pressures on us to to cut out waste and make us more efficient um in the next you know next well, five ten years sort of thing so so i think it's, it's an interesting time um ahead for us um, and obviously we'll be using all the tools that we can to um, make us a success but some really amazing things happening at first group that didn't exist weeks and months ago had never been you know dreamt of but you know that customer experience driven approach People want to know: uh, Should I be waiting for this bus? What's going to happen next? It is incredible that, that measures the, the capacity and the space. Things we never dreamt would uh, would be required. You, you responded and provided them. That's no, and, that, that's, and that's the challenge that we're that we're all facing around. And you know, and it's not just us; it's the whole industry is is looking at what is um, what, what is the new norm. As people keep yeah. seeing the Bitcoin now, so um, we, we're just waiting and, and sort of planning on our best assumptions at the moment. And, um, you know, that's, that's all we can do until, you know, we're, we're, we're back to normal. That, that's right. And I think, you know, your, excuse the pun, your, your customer journey, uh, cause that, that's what you deal in, but you know, the whole customer journey of what they experience is, is really driving the whole of this digital transformation now. And I think some of the early automation, um, automated back office transactions that existed and ended up, you know, landing in the back office. But I think more and more, and certainly our methodology, we're, around the one office concept of looking at customer touch points and uh, in, in summary, following that all the way through uh, a business from the first point of contact where you've got an autonomous back office that works doing what it does and, and fixing those, but you've got an outcome driven front office where people you know, are phoning maybe for, for ticketing or uh, updates and, and, and that kind of stuff. You've got those two really working together and following that customer you know, journey through there. And that's kind of, that's got various different elements in the digital operations that's following through where you're starting to digitize and uh, ticketing obviously people understand now yeah, is, is digital uh, and and that's kind of where you've got a lot of those transactions going we've got intelligent support functions like you're building that, that give that uh, indication but that's supported by the decisioning and insight that's uh, that's built in for example by how many people are already you know, in, in that transport that's something that nobody was really you know, recording before uh, so you know those kind of flow throughs of those different technologies all working together uh, to look at the one office end to end customer journey uh, approach to dealing um, with transactions is is how I think people are going to come out of this really really looking again and looking at strategically what what will have to structurally change in people's organisations what they don't want to do anymore and what they need to do an awful lot more of um, in order to, to to meet customer expectations that are constantly changing as we know yeah i think one of the other things that we've we've seen is that you know with the um the covid crisis we said to people do not use cash on a bus now we've been trying for many many years to move people to smart cards and to mobile ticketing 
Um, and this now, as Bathy said, there's still people who still think you need to have your three pound fifty on in, in cash to go and do it. So again, it's taking out that sort of um, that process at the front end from the customer that makes you can you know you can you can use your your, your smart card, you can use your your bank card, you can use your mobile phone. You're not touching anything, which at the moment is is quite crucial. And um, and more importantly, that the drivers then not going to hand any cash to then you know potentially have a be at risk there. So again. We have to change our sort of back office to 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 mirror what what we're doing at the front, and um, we're trying to do the same on rail um, and bus and, and in America as well. It's it's you know it's it's a it's a real move now towards that sort of um, cashless you know, interaction, using your phone, using the technology rather than us doing the traditional way of pay your fare on a bus or you know wait for the stop to be announced, that kind of thing. So it's it, it's quite a it's an interesting and exciting time. I think it's just been brought forward because of the situation we're in. Yeah, so you know, an acceleration of some of those things, but not necessarily on the terms you expected and uh, at that speed. Yeah, so very interesting times. I think, that, I think that that's super interesting. And, and it really tells us that of all the ways it's impacted us from as people, as businesses, um, the one thing that's remained true is that customer experience. And one of the things that I found really interesting is that we've been thinking about, you know, when you're automating in the back office, you're really taking that information and you're able to turn it into action. And I think those points that you illustrated, Andy, um, actually kind of bring it to life perfectly of how what's happening on the back office really brings it to life in the front office. So I think we've covered, you know, quite a bit of ground so far. So thanks to you both. Um, I'm just hoping that at this point now, we could maybe take a moment and think about if you both kind of share some of your top key takeaways that we want our listeners to think about and consider as they really think about not only getting started on their journey, but in the new normal, as we call it, or in this kind of new climate that we have uh, faced ourselves in, what do they need to think about in order to set their IA programs up for a sustainable success going forward? So Andy, is that something maybe you can share a couple of those key yeah. takeaways? Yeah, I think our, our first lesson, um, we did do it as a pilot. Um, you know, we, we'd heard about RPA and we were interested um, and we got um, Symphony involved at that stage to come and sell it to us. Um, that's why we committed to a pilot. I think the key thing is that the business buys into it, not only, you know, the, in, in our terms of the division that we're going to, to invert commas sell it to, but the whole organization sees this as a um a very worthwhile project um and not to be let's do it in one area let's do it in the back office or let's do it you know in bus and not rail or america it needs to be having that backing and i think we, we we got that um in the early stages so you know the only time i would talk to the chief executive on certain things you take and how are we doing with the rpa project so it was seen as a as a as a big project um, I think the key to that is then don't go into any project thinking you know the processes that you are going to automate. I think you have ideas and you have that list and then you then do the work and then look at it with you know the experts um, and our team have, have developed a number of those skills so now our pipeline is is maybe slightly different because they know yeah well we're not going to benefit or that's not going to help us or you know there's no point in doing this because um, so I think that's the other key and taking your time to design that flow. And if we do need to change the process, change it, um, but make sure you know the process in, in the first place. And I think that was the big thing that we found such, uh, such a benefit in our um, finance shared services in Aberdeen was that um, they have, you know, they've got quality um, uh, qualifications um, in terms of the way they process things. So we had process documentation which was great because, you know, getting information from a document that's a proper process document is fantastic, for, not only for us, but for the, um, the consultants coming in from Symphony to say, ah, oh, that's what you do, rather than have a chat to the person that says, well, yeah, Bill does this and Fred does that and whatever. It's, it's all that kind of um, background information. And use the experts, use the people who do that job. Um, once you get over the, the uh, impact of we're, we're trying to help you rather than we're trying to take your job away, which was another thing that we do get um, uh, faced with uh, in some areas, um, we're trying to improve the efficiency. And, and one of the things that we sold a lot of the, the, a lot of the 
the process control, certainly with the, the, the starters, was GDPR and about data, about personal data being flown around the business uh, via an email or piece of paper. By automating that in a central, then we can control it. So again, look at those kind of areas that say that by replacing a current process, which may not be the best compliant, you can actually get compliant and you know, and you can have it audited. So from our point of view, you know, we've ticked a number of boxes other than it being more efficient process. Thanks, Andy. So what about you, James? My, my views are very, are very consistent. There's a couple of things that I'll uh, pick up and, and build on. So I think the strategy and vision and sponsorship are the first kind of couple of things. And you were very clear you had that. You had the CIO leading, leading the project with you. Uh, but we had the CEO, uh, as you said, sponsorship, and, and that was going. But you know, also within uh, the business, as you said, you have to uh, bring people with you. So as you said, you know, the thing we're trying to sell to them, and I'd say exactly the opposite, um, it needs to be their individual divisions project. It's somebody doing sort of some kind of business improvement from outside uh, to them is not the message you really want because when things really take off, they see that this is a tool that will really help the business give them much more time to deal with the matters that they want to deal with, kind of make it their project. And I mean, for all people on the sponsorship, so if you've got a risk team and all those kind of people that could be very concerned about things and shut you down, if they're part of your team and actually they become the intelligent automation risk uh, business partner, you know, they are looking for more and more solutions. And I think that's really important. Once you've got the strategy that you use the sponsorship, bring people with you, make it their project, get, get, get them involved. I think that's very important. I think what you said um, about processes, choosing the right processes and the right businesses by being strategic about it uh, and looking at that, doing some kind of a discovery or you know, nominating a, a business that will have a sponsor and will really uh, evangelize about it and then choosing the right processes. There's nothing more heartbreaking than if somebody picks it as a pet uh, project and they haven't done that thorough work to find that it actually halfway through, it's not automatable or even worse, it gets automated and it doesn't deliver the benefit you'd hoped, and it doesn't, you know, uh, trail the way for other processes behind it. So that, that, that whole thing. And then I think it comes down to governance um, and, you know, the whole framework and approach to this. So if you put in a governance process, and I, and I mean very, very broadly, so that this is how we do it. This is the steps. This is how you go through it. Um, and these are the sign-offs because we've done that, and now they'll happen faster so that you can repeat your successes. You can do this over and over again. It's not a one-off. Um, project this is something that you can get enterprise-wide benefit across because we've done this um, the first time will be harder but the second third fourth and fifth should really flow a lot better you should know your sign-offs uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise people will back you because they know what you've done and, and that's really important that it becomes really scalable and you're really doing this for big business benefit um, and, it, and it makes a difference to your business because that's what we're all, all here for is to, is to make uh, the, the, the tangible business returns from this technology, which um, which it really does. It's really, really, really providing a lot of business benefit to people. Not just uh, as we said at the beginning, you know, with your with your vision and, and why you're doing it, but the, the accuracy, the improvement, as well as time saved um, you know, and, and not, not wasted. So there's so many good reasons um, to, to use the technology and to, to get it delivering benefit fast um, at a low cost is, is really the goal. Uh, when you've gone enterprise wide like you have. Thanks guys. I think those are some really critical points to reiterate. One of the key takeaways that I picked up on was the importance of monitoring and evaluation with each cycle of automation. Not only to ensure that you're driving value, but also to really accelerate your subsequent efforts for sustainable results and growth. So I think that we're just about out of time, but once again, I'd really like to thank you both for sharing your insight and your knowledge today. And many thanks to our viewers as well. If you'd like to hear more about First Group's approach to RPA and the specifics of what led them to be shortlisted for the Blue Prism Newcomer Award, be sure to stop by the Virtual Symphony booth. And to stay connected, please consider following us on LinkedIn or subscribing to our blog for timely insights and updates. Thanks again and take care.